Hey guys, um, this is going to be our lecture video for the evidence for evolution and also I'll talk about some of the mechanisms for evolution as well. So I expect that you're going to copy down these notes just like you would if we were in class. The process of writing them down will help you to remember them and have you think about them as you do your reading and other future assignments. Um, and of course, you can always just pause the video anytime you need a little more time to copy things down. All right, so uh, when we talk about evolution, we have four um, big categories of evidence that we can use to support evolutionary theory. Now, depending on what book and what source you look at, sometimes you'll see these categories or, or types of evidence can be a little bit different, but in general, this is what you're gonna see. So, um, I'm also gonna just see if I can move myself out of, there we go. Okay, um, so uh, we're gonna look at fossil evidence for evolution, which is some pretty good evidence, but it's also not perfect, and we'll talk about that. Um, we're gonna talk about geographic distribution. This is something that Darwin uh, was quite keenly aware of. And we're gonna talk a little bit about comparative embryology, um, which has been a little bit, um, Controversial is not quite the right word, but it's, it's been debated recently as to whether or not it's a great source of evidence for evolution, especially now that we have molecular biology, which lets us look at both the biochemistry evidence and straight to the DNA evidence. Um, in some ways, when we look at these first few categories, these are things that we use before we had the power and tools of molecular bi biology. Now that we have that, maybe these ones aren't quite so important to us, but they're still really interesting to think about. Um, and so we will. Okay, so um, when we think about fossil evidence, um, I can't make the little thing go away now. There we go, okay. So we talk about um, fossil evidence. Um, what we hopefully will think about is what we can see right here, this um, fossilized fish where the organic material of the organism has been replaced by minerals from the uh, sedimentary rock that it was buried in. Um, this is where a little knowledge of earth science can be really helpful if you understand um, how sedimentary rocks form. It really helps to make sense of how fossils form in them, but unfortunately that's another class and we don't really have time, so you'll have to take my word on it. Um, so any, technically by the way, any kind of preserved remain or marking is considered a fossil. So when an insect is trapped in amber or when uh, like a woolly mammoth was frozen in ice, those are all examples of fossils. They're just different kinds of fossils. Um, but sedimentary rock, like we see in, in this particular picture, um, is really common. We see a lot of this like in the Grand Canyon and other parts of the Western United States. So it's layers or strata of rock that forms over time due to erosion of rock from other places that gets carried and deposited. And so things can get trapped in that sediment. And then those layers give us a sense of when those fossils might have formed. Um, some of the oldest fossils that paleontologists have found have been between 3.8 and 3.5 billion years old. So really old fossils, um, and some of those are of large bacterial colonies known as stromatolites. So here's kind of a cartoon picture. Um, obviously the layers on top are typically the newest unless something has happened like maybe an earthquake that has caused the earth to flip over or volcanic eruptions that cause some kind of fracture or disruption. But in general, the layers give us a good sense of relative time. And then scientists can use things like radioactive dating or other chemical dating um, to try to determine the exact age of a particular layer. Um, sometimes they can also use certain fossils um, act as like landmarks of time because we know when certain fossils or certain living things existed. So when we find those fossils, then that tells us the age of that whole layer. So um, paleontologists and earth scientists and geologists, they have lots of ways of dating um, rock. And this is just an example of the Grand Canyon, which is a fantastic example of sedimentary rock. You can really see all of the layers here. And if you've ever been out there or you get a chance to go visit, you'll definitely get to see some fossils. Um, and also, if you're interested, you can see some petroglyphs, some written carved language from a very long time from some ago from some of the native peoples. 
Um, we can also look at geographic evidence. Um, if you probably heard about Pangea when all of the continents were one, when all the tectonic plates were together, now they've moved apart due to the principles of the plate tectonic theory. It's sort of sliding on this molten uh, layer that we have underneath Earth's crust. Um, but what we notice when we look at fossils um, is that we'll find fossils of animals on different continents and in the present day there's no way that um, for example here this whole band during Pangaea would have been subtropical but today this area of Africa is sub-equatorial but this area of South America is high in altitude and, and, and uh, cold so we wouldn't expect the same animal to be able to live there but it does support plate tectonic theory because when these continents were together in one mass, this would have been a similar um, biome and climate, which would allow that organism to live in those areas. And you can see we have lots of examples of that. Um, also, you can look at different rocks. Like there are actually rock formations on different continents that match up. Um, so there's multiple ways that the geographic evidence can be used to support both plate tectonic theory and theory of evolution. The comparative anatomy evidence is when scientists look at um, the anatomy of the adult and then also we'll look specifically at comparative embryology which is when you look at the anatomy of the developing embryo but here in the adult you can see that there are variations on a common structural theme and let me see if I can just move myself out of the way I'll go over here now um, so if we look here this is the a human arm um, here we have the ulna the radius and the humerus and then we have our uh, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. And if you look here at this whale, it's also a mammal like us, there's the humerus, there's our uh, radius and ulna, our carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So it's essentially all the same bones, they've just, you know, their structure has been modified to better suit the needs of, in this case, swimming. Um, if you look at this bird wing, you can see, again, we're going to have that same basic structure, what is essentially the humerus, ulna, and radius. And then you can see there's a lot more modification down here in the carpals and phalanges, so there's not as many bones in here for the wing. Um, and then if you look at this forelimb of a house lizard, again, it's really similar to both the whale and the man um, and uh, humans. So you can see that there is definitely a relationship here that would suggest descent with modification. Now, we don't we share a common ancestor with some of these examples. We don't come from any of them. In fact, nobody comes from anything. Um, humans didn't evolve from monkeys um, or from apes. Um, we share a common ancestor back many, 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 many millions of years ago. We diverged a long time ago. Um, Okay, and if we look at the comparative embryology, you can see here, here's the lizard, a tortoise, a pig, and a human. And you can see that at the very earliest stages of embryological development, it's quite difficult to tell these embryos apart. And even later on, um, you can see the pig and the human are looking an awful lot alike, whereas the lizard and the uh, tortoise here are also looking a lot alike. That makes sense. These are closer relatives. We are closer relatives to pigs. Um, and then as um, you get to the fully developed embryo, you can start to see more differences. But again, a lot of similarities between the lizard and the tortoise. And I, you know, I think you can make a claim there's some similarities here as well. Um, so th this is some additional evidence. But again, comparative embryology is sort of moving to the outs um, because it's just not necessary anymore. But for early scientists, this was some very tantalizing uh, data for them. Then we have molecular biology. And honestly, the molecular biology at this point, the tools and the technology are so good, it really lets us get right down to the DNA, looking at the genetics of organisms and seeing how much of our code do we share. Remember, DNA is the universal code for all living things. So we all have it. We all use the same four bases. We're all making the same amino, you know, 20 amino acids. And then 
assembling those to make this almost infinite variety of proteins, which is what gives this intense and infinite variation we see among living things. Um, so before we could really get down to the DNA, we could look at the biochemistry at the proteins so and we could compare proteins. So maybe we could look at the hemoglobin of humans versus the hemoglobin of um, apes or monkeys or dogs. Um, and we could see how similar are those hemoglobin proteins. And there are differences. And the further, um, the more the differences, then the less closely related we are. And the same exact thing happens with the DNA. Um, so we use the DNA to estimate how closely relate, related we are to other species based on similarity in the DNA sequences. And we're going to have a lab that looks at um, that uh, exact thing in terms of the sequence and uh, subsequent amino acids. So I think you'll like that tomorrow. Okay. So some mechanisms of evolution. We already talked about natural selection. So hopefully you have that one um, kind of already in your mind. Um, and But natural selection isn't the only mechanism for evolution. It's probably just, it's the big one to be sure. But we have a few others. So we are also going to have, in addition to natural selection, we talked about artificial selection, which really is just like artificial, uh, excuse me, it's just like natural selection, except that it's the humans making the choices among the variants that nature has provided, as opposed to the environment or nature choosing among the variation that uh, already exists. So we've talked about those two. Um, and today we're going to talk about genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation. So mutation is a mechanism of evolution and it's a source of variation. It's a mechanism of evolution and it's a source of variation. That can be a little confusing, so hence why I repeated it. Um, so let's get right into reviewing natural selection before we dig into the others. So what we talked about in class was how in natural selection, populations of organisms tend to overproduce. Um, and there's also variation among offspring. That overproduction results in a struggle for existence. And since there's variation, some will be better um, at surviving and reproducing. So we'll see different levels of fitness, um, which is also known as differences in reproductive success. Um, and those traits that grant the greatest fitness, um, they are more likely to be passed on to offspring, and those offspring are more likely to survive and reproduce. And so over time, we may see that particular trait become an adaptation, and that adaptation could result in evolution of that species. Um, so that, so we have some of the we call microevolution. That's when there's a change in the frequency of an allele or a trait within a population. And then we have macroevolution, which is also known as speciation, which is the actual formation of new species. So there's sort of different kinds of evolution. Evolution at the allele or DNA level, where we're just seeing a shift in the frequency of a particular trait um, in a population. And then there's that macroevolution, which is when that trait actually becomes um, universal across that population and you start to see a speciation event occur where though that population is becoming a new species. But maybe other populations of that particular species do not. They live somewhere else, conditions are different, or that variation never showed up to be selected for. And so they're remaining the same, but this one population is evolving and ultimately may speciate out into a new species. So one example of this is the peppered moss, and they are mentioned in the crash course video. Um, I will also tell you that the peppered moss are based on probably some flawed and possibly made up data. Um, it doesn't change the fact that there really are peppered moths and that they really did undergo a shift in the frequency of a particular melanistic trait. But the science behind it may not be as good and as tight as we thought. Back then, scientists were not so good about being transparent and honest with their data collection. They wanted the numbers to work out like exactly the way they were supposed to based on probability. They didn't quite get the whole probability thing. Um, whereas we're much more understanding today of how probability 
is the odds and then there's the reality, you know. So just to be aware. I just want you to be aware of that. But they are a great example. Um, so we have these peppered moss. They come in a variety of colors from light to dark. Really, they kind of have like three. There's like a light, a dark, and kind of a medium. Um, and what happened initially is before coal burning, the trees were like birch type trees, they were very light. So the lighter colored moss when they were on the trees were hard to spot by predators. So they had a greater uh, survival rate than the black moss, which really kind of stand out on the light tree. But then the industrial revolution and all the combustion engines resulted in lots of coal being burned. Um, and the pollution, the, the soot that resulted from that literally coated the trees and buildings. And suddenly it wasn't so great to be the light colored moth. Now being the darker colored moth was a real advantage. You blended in, you were camouflaged. Um, and so the uh, lighter colored ones started being picked off by predators at a much greater rate, which meant the darker colored ones had a greater fitness. They were more likely to survive and reproduce and pass on their darker coloring to their offspring. And so what ended up happening is there was a shift in the frequency of the allele that coded for the dark um, coloration. And so that became more prevalent in the population of peppered moths. Um, and of course, this ties in, think back to genetics with dominant and recessive traits. So if the light color is a recessive trait, then that means there will be heterozygous individuals who themselves are dark. And so they have a good chance of survival now, but they're still passing on that light colored allele, which means it's not disappearing entirely. So should conditions change, which they are now, now with pollution control, it may eventually be a very good deal to be the rare moth that's um, born lighter colored and we may see a shift back towards lighter colored moths, a change in the frequency of the allele again as environmental conditions change. Camouflage in general um, is something that we see a lot of, um, it, it's always going to be an adaptation, right? If you're a prey item and you're born with a variation that gives you greater camouflage from predators, that's always going to be selected for. Um, and so we see lots of examples of camouflage adaptations. And this is a snowshoe hair. Um, and so adaptations um, that give you an advantage like camouflage. Um, and camouflage, of course, is going to let you hide from predators. It's always going to be favored by natural selection. But in turn, if you're the predator and you are born with a mutation that gives you better eyesight and you are better able to detect that prey item, that's going to give you an advantage versus other predators that don't have that. And that is, of course, exactly why sometimes a snowshoe hare does get caught by the lynx, even though it is very well camouflaged. Um, won't spend a lot of time on artificial selection. I think you guys are comfortable with this idea, but dog breeds are a great example of artificial selection. This is where humans are selecting for traits that are already present that frankly, nature would never select for, um, but humans will because we think they're cute, you know, like, oh, it's adorable. They don't have a snout. Let's pick a dog with a flat face and breed them. Um, yeah, we can do that. And they are kind of cute, but also they can't breathe. And if you put them outside in the Florida heat, they will die from from heat stroke. So, um, you know, um, and on the other hand, a dog like the Irish wolfhound here, one of the largest dogs in the world, you know, it'd be pretty hard in the wild for them to meet their caloric needs. But as long as they have a human that's providing them with their food, then they're going to be okay. Um, and you can see there's lots of different um, dog breeds. There's the little tiny chihuahua, right? We just kept breeding smaller dogs and smaller dogs and smaller dogs to get these really tiny animals. Um, and that ought to make you think back to genetics and thinking about the consequences of inbreeding too, which is one of the ways that we create dog breeds is we're often mating very closely related individuals that share similar traits to get that trait that we want. But the consequence of that is we may be bringing together recessive traits that are not beneficial. And again, let's take a moment. All recessive traits are not bad, but bad traits that are recessive hide and we don't know about them. And we're more likely to bring them together when we inbreed because related individuals are more likely to share the same alleles. Um, okay, so that brings us to genetic drift, which is a different kind of mechanism for evolution. And we're gonna have three different kinds of genetic drift. 
bottleneck, founder, and non-random mating. So one of the things that's kind of interesting about genetic drift um, is that sometimes it's kind of random. So here's the bottleneck effect. The bottleneck effect is when you have a really large population that has a lot of variation. In this case, yellow and blue. And I think we could probably say that they're either the yellow and the blue are either equal or maybe there's even a few more yellow in the original population. But then something happens and only a few individuals survive. So now we only have, you know, and by the way, just by chance, there was nothing about these individuals that genetically gave them a better chance of survival. So think like a natural disaster, like uh, there was a flood um, and it wiped out a huge number of individuals, or there was a volcanic eruption and it wiped out a huge number of individuals. And just through sheer chance, um, during the flood, these individuals were on high ground for whatever reason and they survived. It wasn't because they were good swimmers or anything like that. So now if we look at this surviving population, there's clearly not the same number of, ye of yellows as there was in the original. And so now when these ones breed, we're going to see a shift. There's a, definitely a lot more blue here than there were yellow ones. It wasn't because blue is better, not like in natural selection where if there was more blue, it would be because blue gave you an advantage. Blue is not an advantage here. It's just that there was more blue as a result of the bottleneck effect. And so more of those alleles are showing up in the population. It could be a good thing in the end, but it could also be a bad thing in the end. There's no way to know because it's just random. Um, this can also happen when individuals... Um, leave a population. So that's the founder effect. So here's our original population with a whole bunch of uh, blues and reds. But then a few individuals might leave and start a new population somewhere else. And if all the ones that leave happen to be red ones or happen to be blue ones, then the subsequent generations are going to look really different than the original population. So that's called the founder effect. And a great example of that in the real world are the Galapagos finches, where just a couple of finches landed on that island. Of, they were mainland finches, landed on the Galapagos Islands 900 miles off the coast. Um, and they were not representative of all of the traits and variation that would have existed in the mainland population. And so subsequently, you got new populations that ended up forming new species of finches on the Galapagos that look nothing like the mainland finches. Um, and then the last thing is um, non-random mating. So you might have, a, say in this case, an insect that comes in several different colors, but females might prefer one color over another. And it might not be that there's anything about that color that actually gives you better fitness. It's just that it's preferred by females. And so, or vice versa, you know, the color of the uh, female is preferred by the male. Um, but point being is it's not random. And in that case, then what's going to happen is we're going to see more individuals of that color, even though it may not be advantageous in the environment. On the other hand, if uh, mating was random within the population, then we would expect the colors to remain the same at whatever distribution of frequency they have. We wouldn't expect any changes. So non-random mating can lead to a shift in the frequency of the allele for the color in that population. So those are Three other, uh, three kinds of genetic drift. It's like drifting. So like, you know, we have a trait with, uh, we have a gene with uh, multiple alleles or a trait with multiple phenotypes and we're seeing a drift in one direction or another, but it's not due to better fitness. That's kind of the key to genetic drift. Gene flow is when there is an exchange of genes with another population. So if you have uh, two populations of daisies and one happens to be white, one happens to be yellow, but the pollinators are moving between those two groups um, or populations of daisies, then those daisies will stay the same species. But if something prevents the gene flow, then what may end up happening is those daisy populations speciate out and you end up with one population that's always yellow and one population that's always white. And eventually they may not be able to um, pollinate, cross pollinate anymore. And now you have two separate species. Um, so 
That's gene flow. Um, and then the last thing is mutation, um, which is any change in the DNA code. But that change does have to be in a gamete. If it's not in a gamete, it's not going to get passed on to the offspring. So you make lots of changes to your DNA um, in cells in your body throughout your lifetime, but you're not passing on your skin cells to your offspring. But if that change happens in an egg cell or in a sperm cell, then that gets passed on to your offspring. And most of the time, mutations are not a good thing, if you remember from genetics, but sometimes they're great. Um, and for asexual reproducing organisms, mutations are really critical because they don't have any recombination, you know, things going on like sexual reproducers do. Um, but again, mutations are often lethal or non-advantageous. It's actually pretty rare for a mutation to be beneficial, but we got to have them because that's our source of variation. So it's a mechanism of evolution and mutations are a source of variation. So um, just be careful with, with that. Okay, a uh, couple, few more things here. Um, really important to remember that an individual never, ever, ever, ever evolves. You cannot will yourself to evolve. Only populations can evolve, right? Um, because an individual's DNA doesn't change. That's, of course, not entirely a true statement. I just said your DNA changes over your lifetime, but only in individual cells not at the germ cell level per se. And and it doesn't change like, again, if it changes in your skin cell due to UV damage, that's not, that change isn't showing up in your egg or sperm cell. So that's not going to pass on. And if it doesn't pass on, then it's not evolution. Um, but the frequency of an allele within a population can change. Um, and some of, that's what we've just been talking about, right? And some of the ways that the frequency of an allele can change in a population. So brown hair becomes more common or blonde hair becomes more common. Um, one, some of the ways that that can happen is due to reproductive isolation, um, behavioral isolation, geographic isolation, or temporal isolation. So anything that keeps two populations reproductively isolated could result in a shift in the frequency of an allele in one or both of those populations. So if normally they had gene flow, but something happened and they're separate, like a river comes through and they can't cross the river, now those populations are reproductively isolated and you may have a bottleneck effect on, you know, they might have different um, gene pools on each in each population now. And so over time, the frequency of particular alleles becomes very different between the populations on either side of the river. Um, you could have populations living um, in the same area, but if some individuals become behaviorally isolated, like they act different than other members of their population, um, then they may not um, mate with other individuals. They may only mate with those individuals that act like them. Um, and so ultimately they end up speciating and you get this speciation event that happens even though they're living in the same geographic area. Um, the, I just, sorry, let me correct something. My description of the river coming through is a great example of geographic isolation. Let me give you a, an example of reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation would be like the um, sperm can't fertilize the egg. Or like in plants, when they when the um, chromosomes don't separate and the offspring has extra chromosomes, they then can't sexually reproduce with the parent species because they can't have different numbers of chromosomes. That's reproductive isolation. Sorry about that. Um, and then temporal isolation is when species um, reproduce at different times. So, for example, frog species, you might have multiple species of frog living in the same pond, but each of them reproduces at a different time, and that way there is not mating between the different species. Because in, in the case of frogs, it's possible that they could fertilize a different species' eggs, but they can't because they reproduce at different times during the spring or summer, so it prevents that possibility from happening. So those are all different ways that changes could happen in the frequency of an allele. Darwin's finches on the Galapagos that I mentioned earlier, 
The founders arrived, so we had a founder event, so genetic drift. They were then geographically isolated from the mainland finches, so there was no gene flow happening. Um, there were then changes in the gene pool, um, and then within the species, within the populations, or sorry, within the generations of finches that were being born from the founders, over time, there might have been some behavioral isolation. Um, and that ended up splitting that population into two species and so on and so forth. Um, and competition might have driven a lot too. So when there reached a certain number of birds on the island and they were competing for limited resources, all of a sudden beak size might matter, right? So you might be very similar, but if you have a slightly bigger beak and there's not a lot of seeds left on the island, but you can crack the big ones, that's going to give you a real advantage. And you're only going to end up hanging out with other birds that have that slightly bigger beak that can eat those bigger nuts which or seeds, which means you're going to be more likely to reproduce with them and pass that on. And so now you got the little beaked birds hanging out over there and the big beaked birds hanging out over there and they diverge and you end up with two different species of finch um, after a period of time. Good reminder that adaptations are heritable variations that are inherited by all members of the population. Of course, there can always be a mutant, but in general, all members of the population have it. Remember that adaptations could be structural, like hair color or fur color, um, but they could also be physiological, like you have an enzyme in your stomach that lets you eat rotten things without it killing you, um, or it lets you eat poisonous leaves without it poisoning you, even though it poisons everybody else that eats it. Or it could be behavioral, that you have a particular behavior that gives you an advantage. So there's a lot of different kinds of adaptations, but we tend to focus on what things look like. But actually, the physiological and the behavioral adaptations might be even more important. So don't forget about those. Adaptations are always beneficial or they're not an adaptation. All right. Um, and adaptation is a product of evolution, specifically microevolution and eventually maybe macroevolution. All right. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about. Oh, actually, I'm going to add one more little thing on. We're going to talk more about it, but I'm going to give you a little warm up. We're going to talk about the Hardy-Weinberg principle, which looks at the frequency of alleles in a population. Um, and the Hardy-Weinberg principle has a few rules. Um, so in order for the frequency of an allele not to change, you would have to have a large non-evolving population. Um, and if that's the case, then the frequency of genotypes and alleles would remain constant. But basically, that almost never happens. So instead, what we see is there's often changes in the frequency of alleles. So we'll look at how to do that mathematically when we see each other next week. All right. Enjoy.